it's lovely to be here and to see so many people here to enjoy this afternoon. And this is what this collection looks like, and I'm just hoping that everybody wants a copy of it. It's a wonderful collection, and it was a great privilege and pleasure to edit it. What I wanted to do was talk a little bit about the collection and read a couple of tiny extracts from it just to give you a sense of the whole collection before I introduce Donna and Miriam. And I think perhaps I'm just thinking who will read first. I hadn't really thought about that. Sorry. <laughs> we'll sort it out. I'll, I'll make a decision along the way. So, as I say, editing this collection was an amazing experience. Caroline Wood had this fantastic idea for a collection on fire, in a sense to um, commemorate and recognise those Margaret River fires that happened late in 2011. So, she and her editorial board worked through the first half of 2012 and then a lot of the material that had come in uh, which had been vetted by the editorial board and one member of the editorial board is here, so welcome Richard, uh, came to me and uh, together Caroline and I made kind of final decisions about the material. As Caroline said, it contains poems and stories and essays and also um, visual material some work that was in an exhibition on fire early this year at the um, Holmes Court Gallery at Bass Felix and other photo essays that were made in this area after the fires by various people. Uh, so that material is excellent, I think, wonderful in the book as well. As well, there are little extracts from oral histories that were collected after the fires from people in the area by the Margaret River Historical Society and the Community, the Resource, Community Centre. Resource Centre. And there are extracts from those as well. So it's a very varied collection. Some of the work has a historical significance, much of it is contemporary and local, and um, some of it is refers to the kind of legendary and mythic significances of fire. And all of those extraordinary kind of um, Associations of fire come up in different ways in the collection. So, as I say, it's an amazing uh, collection and one that everybody should have. What I wanted to do, as I say, was just read a couple of little extracts from it. One is a tiny description of one of the paintings that was in that fire exhibition that I referred to, and this book was actually launched, I think, at that exhibition. I wasn't able to be there. So it's a very beautiful work, probably too hard for everybody to see at this distance, uh, by a Joseph Jingala Zimran, and it's called Fire Dreaming. And so this um, uh, this recalls the kind of associations within indigenous communities that fire has and its dream dreaming aspects. He writes, Bushfire Dreaming. This dreaming was passed down to me from my father. It's about when three big bushfires travelled across the land. They left big scars as they burnt the dry scrub that was spread across the sand dunes. In this painting, it shows the burning fires. Very beautiful uh, description, I think. The other little extract I wanted to read, well, it's a tiny bit longer. It's a poem by Miranda Aitken, who I hadn't met before this afternoon, but she's here this afternoon, but she felt perhaps I should read this rather than she reading it. It's called Isaac's Land is Burning and it refers directly to, in a poetic way, to the Margaret River fires and an area in Margaret River. And it's quite an extraordinary poem because it's set in three columns and it has no punctuation, but I will have to draw breath as I read. Mm -hmm. You pack your car full of unusual combinations. Ten t-shirts, no underwear, leave baby photos by the back door. Two men to face a fire. You flee the house, the hill, the smoke, the ash, the heat, the roar. Safety is anxious boredom. Safety is time ticking like a child's ice cream in melting sun. Until smoke clouds build and climb into the sky. Sorry. Celluloid cinders float on into town and a river receives history's scattered ashes. New green heels, but it still feels like only yesterday you, uh, you flee. You needed to flee. 
So as I say, that's a very um, interesting poetic response uh, to the fires. And the very final words of the collection, I thought I would read too. These are the final words of a photograph essay by um, Maury Roach. And he writes, in my photographs, I try and show my awe and respect for nature's fire. It's very much a part of our lives in Australia. And I think there are reminders of that all the time. So, as I say, it's a wonderful volume and I urge everyone to um, pick up a copy today. As I say, two of the contributors are here to read, I think, from their work in the volume and maybe talk about it a little bit this afternoon. So I'll introduce first Miriam Weiwei Lo. Miriam is a homemaker who's lived in Margaret River for the last five years with her family. She's also a very uh, widely published West Australian poet. Her first book, uh, called Against Certain Capture, was shortlisted for the Premier's Book Awards, the West Australian Premier's Book Award, Premier's Prize in 2005. And her most recent collection, No Pretty Words, was published in 2010. So welcome, Miriam, and okay. thank you. I might stand, if that's okay with the web lady. No, no, I have the neck. <laughs> Can't tilt it up a little it's bit. It's a little bit tricky, it's isn't it? A bit tricky. All right, I'll sit. Can you hear me? <laughs> up the back, great. I just want to say I had such fun writing this poem. Um, it was a great opportunity to just think about fire in all its different sort of associations and the different ways it connected to my life. and. I really enjoyed that and really appreciate the opportunity that I had to play with all of those things. I'm going to read. It's, it's a poem in, in seven bits. It's a, it's a numbered poem and I'll read those numbers as I go along. It's called Playing with Fire. Everything that could be said about fire leapt from her mouth, blistering inflammatory words hurt and rage, twisted into a ball and doused with petrol. He walks through the fireball and presses his own incandescence to her lips. Two. It is cold. We sit round the firebox, cast iron box with a window. Inside it, defying all logic, the thing that can be seen, that cannot be held in our hands. Oven hot day, devil wind whipping the coastal heath. We sit in our houses, boxes with windows, outside the rising mushroom cloud of smoke, the thing that can be seen, that cannot be held in our hands. Three, great uncle's house, burning jostics and smouldering resentments. Everyone sits down to New Year's Eve dinner, Hakka village food, every ingredient imbued with tradition, every word heavy with double meaning. What did they give us in those bright red packets? to spend on the future. Four, who inhabits this metaphor, raising its temperature to flashpoint, exploding it into meaning? Who is the fire that consumes at will, the vehement flame of love and the holocaust of judgment, cataclysm of terror and upward rush of hope, throwing sparks, I leap into this name, knowing I will be burnt, knowing I will be saved. Five. Another new year spent away from home. My father and my mother grow old without me. Great uncle's children repeat the Hakka village food without the man who remembers the village. In the funeral drums they burn paper houses for the next life, everything reduced to ash. 
I sift all my longings into bright red packets, pass them on to my children. Six, eight months after the small Gracetown fire, the dunes have barely recovered. Burnt out frames of shrubs and trees pin down the landscape. On the rocky slope facing the beach, the line where the fire was stopped, still clearly visible. Seven, what words are left after consummation? Love and anger lying so close together on the bed. He whispers and she exhales the breath of their completion, a small line of smoke joining earth and heaven. So now I'm really happy to introduce Donna Mazza. Donna uh, coordinates the VA program at ECU Southwest, it is Cowan University Southwest. And I first met Donna when she won the TAG Hungerford Award in, I think it was the 2006 award, wasn't it? Five. For her 2005 award, thanks Donna, for her manuscript, The Albanian, which was published sub subsequently uh, as The Albanian, obviously by Fremantle Press. And uh, Donna is going to read from a story in the collection which has very interesting kind of historical uh, significance. So she's going to talk about it a little bit as well as read from the story, I think. Thanks, Donna. Thanks. Thanks, Donna. Um, this story uh, called Holyoke um, is written from family history. Um, my grandparents had had a um, had a corner store and a petrol station in a small town called Holyoke, which is up in the hills behind Dwelling House. Okay, I'll try. It's not my strong point. So the story is written from family history and um, it's set in a town called Holyoke, which is up in the hills behind Dwelling Up. I grew up with my grandmother and my mother constantly talking about their experience in Holyoke and the fire that destroyed their their house and all of their all of the family heirlooms and and they were always kind of wistfully looking back to the things that were lost. And um, I went there for a visit as a child and the story recounts uh, from my perspective um, what we find there when, when many years have gone past and there are just remnants. So I'm going to read from part way through the story. Her, go her golden head bends in the sun. Margaret scatters her history like seeds. Parts of the garden have grown through the ashes and rubble, Jarrah and Wisteria twisting together, creating a vision of their own. It's not the first time she's been back to Holyoke. Above the tree line, some days in the summer, I see a dark plume of bushfire rising, and I know she will be anxious up there in the hills. She has a bag already packed and photos and an heirloom or two, and she won't leave the dogs behind. Burning, 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 O oh Lord, thou pluckest me out. She was plucked out, sucked through a tunnel of flaming jarrah trees in a green austen. Her father Sid, gripping the steering wheel, set on the road, how his hands must have burned. Her mother Jean, screaming in panic all the way to dwelling up with a birdcage on her sexy knees. Mm -hmm. Two more generations of grandmothers squeezed in the back seat with Margaret and her yellow-eyed panda filled with crackly straw. They didn't take the dog. Sid and Jean drank lemonade in the dwelling up shop. There was lemonade in the fridge at their own shop and he was getting a lift back to Holyoke to pick up the ute and the dog and they would wait on the oval with everyone else. It was after six o'clock when they heard an explosion and looked down the gravel road roared. The heat of the bowsers exploding incinerated the bricks of the fireplace. Jean didn't believe it until she saw her burnt out fridge and all her beautiful china melted together and the huge trees gone, completely gone. 
The wind was strong, the fire coming their way. Jean's hair whipped against her cheeks in warm gusts, which seemed to be blowing her down the gravel road and onto the bitumen and out of that fear where it was really happening after all. The postmistress was right when she told them to leave. They waited too long. Sid thought about this all this occasionally, years later when he was holding his knife and fork in a lovely Laminex kitchen. Sometimes he would tap the ash from his pipe on a cracked red step and plan to build a doll's house, but in January 1961, he pulled up his trousers, tightened his braces and grasped the steering wheel of his green Austin, thinking he would rather stay on the oval in dwelling up with everyone else, but Jean wanted to get out. He was afraid and nobody was leaving with them down the smoky road in the dark. He thought of his girl Jean smiling in her wartime shoes <clears throat> by a water tank, her legs so small and definite. He saw the panic wriggling wildly in her blue eyes and drove into the smoke. They were the last car to leave dwelling up that night. She could not stop screaming and screaming at the windscreen nightmare. Trees were blazing all around, engines and machines tried to extinguish the forest, but the roar of the fire was louder and the wind and flames chased them down the road with, curi with furious crackling. Sid squinted in the smoke and could barely see to guide the green Austin as fast as it could go, and branches fell and burnt behind and all around and flames raged either side down that long descending road. Even through the smoke she could smell Sid's tobacco. Her face grew red and blistering from the heat inside the car. She listened to the falling trees, the crackling and screaming all around, eyes closed, hoping him into the creek, his howl echoing through silent smoky Holyoke. Thank you. So those two pieces give you a taste of the kind of variation in the collection and there's a great deal more. Can I just ask you to thank both our readers, uh, Margaret River Press, uh, Cullen Wines and Writing WA for bringing this session to us this afternoon and stay, enjoy the wine and listen to the music and buy some books. <laughs>